Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, giver of love and life. Uh, come, Heavenly Father. Uh, come, Holy Spirit, Spirit of the Father and the Son. Fill us with that light, life, love, and joy of your presence right now in this difficult um, discussion that the world and 80% of Catholics don't understand about uh, humanae vitae and the inseparable connection between love and life in marriage. And Our Lady Seat of Wisdom and St. Joseph uh, pray for us. Okay, it's also the octave day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, so happy octave, July 23rd. Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace, it's all a gift. And again, the law of the gift, that if we forget that, then none of this makes sense anymore. And it's all patterned on the Trinity, which make a complete gift of themselves, each of them to the other two persons, receiving, giving themselves completely, receiving from the other two completely, giving themselves back. And that crossfire of love, which between the Father and the Son, which is another person, the Holy Spirit. So that's the model for you know, the exemplar and the foundation for all of our uh, relationships and our loving. So this is the crux of everything, the vertical and the horizontal coming together like the cross back there in this chapter three of part two or chapter eight of the, the book here. And the Pope knew, as he says here on page 94, when Watiwa became Pope, he recognized with prophetic intuition that one of his highest priorities must be to deepen the biblical and philosophical underpinnings for the teaching in Humanae Vitae. Why? How so? Or why? Well, because, I mean, you can't force people, but you can make something more attractive by, you know, breaking it down for them or, or opening it up, the treasure of it. So Humanae Vitae was pretty kind of bare bones, but with his encyclicals and familiaris consortio, and then especially with the man and woman he created them, the theology of the body, the Pope is showing the, you know, giving a reason for our hope, as uh, one Peter says. This is why there's an insep why is there an inseparable connection between human love and marriage and the transmission of human life, procreation, the one flesh union that's meant to and is ordered towards new life. Uh, how does that work? And so he gave the biblical and the philosophical underpinnings of it in theology of the body, and that's why it's so powerful and why we're all attracted to it, because it speaks to who we are and whose we are. And as Mary Healy points out, now the background, this is hugely rejected still and by less and less but still plenty of hierarchs priests in the church one is too many and there's way more than one anyway we get this taught to us in the seminary and i don't know what happens i think there's a spirit of anti you know humane vitae in seminaries that then especially in the past and it makes sense because what happened? The day that it was promulgated, July 25th, 1968, what happened? On the steps of the cathedral in Washington, D.C., 200 priests protested and told people, you don't have to listen to the Pope. Just follow your conscience. Don't worry about the Pope and what he's saying. And again, we need to remember how Pope Paul VI arrived at his decision. It was painstaking. He did not have the gift of seeing things quickly and, and not letting the opposition build its momentum. So he's got the majority telling him, Holy Father, give the green light to contraception. Come on, the Anglican Church already did it back in 1933. Uh, there's no problem with this. And he's hesitating, he's hesitating. He's listening to Cardinal Wojtyla over in Poland, who's trapped there because of the communists. But they're, but they're communi communicating. And then finally he sees the tail of the snake when the majority tells him, and these are, you know, priest bishops on the, on the commission, and, and I suppose some lay people too. I mean, his own brothers, and they're saying, go for it, Holy Father. And why should you go for it? Because God gave us 10 commandments and five, three of them are divine, and the other seven he left up to us to interpret. And when he heard that, the experts who studied the whole process leading up to July 25th, 1968, but when he heard that, he saw the tail of a snake. Like that, that is not, that is patently not true. That he left seven up to us and we can just interpret. That's going back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We determine what's right and wrong. Wrong. And so he said, okay, I, I now see clearly enough. And he wrote and promulgated Humanae Vitae. And he gave those four prophetic prophecies that if, if the culture continues to, you know, go down this road of contraception, which we're not going down, um, you're going to see an increase of uh, immorality, violence in society. You're going to see a decrease of respect for women. You're going to see a decrease of accepted children, pregnancies, you know, 
because the, the claim was a, with contraception, we'll have less unwanted pregnancies. And he was saying, no, you're going to have more. And then four, you're going to have an increase in governmental interference in your life. And every single one of those four, for anybody who's honest, has shown itself that it did happen and has continued to happen. So if you forget the law of the gift, you're going to go for, you know, happiness is having what I want. What I want right now is I can't have this child, so okay, I've contraception failed, so I have to back it up with abortion. And I got people screaming, say, okay, if the Supreme Court says no to abortion, then we're gonna make you know sure that New York, California are havens for abortion, and we're gonna make sure that everybody has a right and access to contraception. So the, the problem is that contraceptive mentality of, yes, I didn't create myself, I have this beautiful body that I can you know have marital, hopefully, but even <laughs> More, a lot of most people have non-marital intimacy with each other. So this great, as Jan Smith puts it, ability to throw a party, you know, with another human being and the giver of party goods, God, you're telling him, stay out. I do not want you to show up at this party. So I'll have the love, but not the life. And then the flip side of that is all these couples that are aching to have children. So if we can do it with technology, let's have the babies without the bonding. And then that, you know, demeans the dignity of the child also. A child is meant to come into the world accepted by the father and the mother and not be like, oh, this contraception is supposed to block this. And you know, here's a child, Genesis 4. You could hear Eve saying, I have begotten a child with the help of a man as a really sardonic, sarcastic, not just like, oh, I've begotten a child with the help of man. Like, wonderful. No, like, oh, gosh. It's the beginning of the contraceptive mentality. I didn't want this to happen. And then all the fallout that we see in healing prayer ministry of people who feel rejected and they don't even know why. Because too often it goes way back even to the womb and they picked up the rejection even though they're you know not even fully formed yet. It's incredibly painful and that's not God's plan for us. And so if we keep to his plan, and then the good news then is natural family planning. Imagine if this is the Catholic Church's response to people saying, you know, like Planned Parenthood and others said, we're going to give you contraceptives in your back to school kits, in not just middle school now, but probably grade school, I don't know, late grade school, sixth grade, something like that. And why are we going to do that? Because we can't trust you and you are basically like cattle or rabbits. You're just going to do it. And so if you're going to do it, then, you know, be protected. I'm not telling you that, you know, the protection is failing. 15% 15 of the time, just in condoms, let alone the other things. So you just have one bullet in the chamber of a six chamber gun and um, you can play Russian roulette and just trust that, you know, you're not going to you're not going to pull the trigger when the bullet's in there. Who in the world would do that? And who in the world would go so they're saying, we're going to shovel contraceptives at you. The Catholic Church says, no, no, you have a human you have the built-in dignity, you have you you share in the in the divine reason and will that with training and, and um, help, you can not breed like cattle and rabbits. You can control yourselves with the help of natural family planning, which is more effective than even the pill. The pill, they only tell you, they say 99% effective. Yeah, or 98%. First year use, they don't tell you that. Is it, and it keeps dropping after each year. And then they don't tell you the normal side effects of the pill, which is what? Four things. It's in the insert, which you have to ask for because they won't give it to you because they know that people are getting smart about this and they don't want to let you get too smart about this, that, that maybe you're not gonna, you're gonna start hitting their wallet. They're not buying these things because they're so bad for you. You go up to the pharmacy. Uh, yes, please, I'd like to you know have this for my girlfriend or my wife. Uh, could you please give her something that's gonna increase her tendency to gain weight, increase her tendency towards depression, increase her tendency towards heart disease and other diseases, and decrease her libido. Those four things we think are so wonderful that please give us a pill. Are you kidding me? And then they don't tell you also that uh, it works three ways, not one way, three ways. It prevents ovulation, slows down sperm movement. The third way is an abortifacient. It prevents implantation. You can't control how it works in your body for a woman. It just works the way it's going to work, usually by preventing ovulation, but not always. So the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists got smart and changed the definition of pregnancy from uh, conception to implantation. So if the fertilized egg, this person, this human living being, doesn't implant in, in the uterine wall, there's no pregnancy. Baloney. Good Hebrew word. Baloney. 
Jeff David said that. But natural family planning, which as she points out, is very, you know, it works just as well as the pill first year and second year and third year. Mother Teresa taught it to 17,000 Indian women. Two thirds of them, I think, were Muslim. And they had a the lowest conception rate. And people say, well, what's the difference between that and, and a contraceptive? You know, you're still trying to avoid a conception. Yeah, but it's the difference between saying a lie with your body. I give myself completely to you uh, here, but I'm going to hold back my fertility. So I'm not giving myself completely to you. So you're saying yes and no at the same time. That's a false prophet. You're prophesying falsely with your body. You're lying to the other person and they're lying to you. That's not good for any human being, right? With natural family planning, you're not lying. You're just not speaking. So if you decide to avoid the fertile times because for serious reasons, you can, as Hermione Vitae said, for serious reasons, you can even indefinitely, like with no time limit, avoid a conception, but then do it this way by studying the, the your particular cycle and that each woman's different and then avoiding those times, which is really difficult and painful. And I know some women have told me that, you know, Father, you got to tell people that it's not so rosy as they try to make it sound. Most women are irregular. And so if you're going to use natural family planning, you're going to be abstaining a lot and it's going to strain your marriage. Yeah, I, I hear that. And so we want to help people. It, it is a cross. There is a cross involved and the Jesus is there with each person and with each couple. You know, with all of this difficulty around us, that last question there at the end of the chapter, think of someone you know who is struggling to care for children in difficult circumstances. Thank the Lord for the gift that those children are to the world and find a way to reach out to the parent in affirmation and practical support. Yes, you know, help them be aware that you're praying for them, that you know that it's not easy uh, to raise a child in the world. And, and if they don't have any, if they're trying to have children, they can't, that how much of a cross that is, and that you're praying for them. And, you know, the help of like Encounter and the healing ministry, you can use your baptismal authority and pray for a person in the name of Jesus. You know, if they want a child, you can help them to remove obstacles in the name of Jesus. We're not supposed to pray or prophesy into people's, into birth and death and vocation, but, you know, a baby or to, you know, maybe they're too fertile and, and they're struggling to abstain and um, observe the, the infertile times. Uh, just, just help them with that. Prayer is powerful. Okay, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay, happy Feast of St. James on Monday, July 25th. It's been a blessing hanging out with you. We've got one more chapter to go. Okay, bye.